Amen. Sometimes songs come together well. I think sometimes words and the music that are put together, they just go together well. Sometimes I sing songs and I think, ooh, I don't know, that tune doesn't seem to go with those words or something, but man, not that song. That song's got it all. I, I mean, I, when, you get to that, when you get to that part where it says, um, um, curtain torn in tune, dead or raised alive, finish the victory cry. Don't you just want to, I mean, don't, you don't want to just sing, finish the victory. Huh? You can't sing it like that. You got you to gotta, you gotta feel it. And then when you, when you come down through and it says, uh, death is crushed to death, life is mine to live, won through your selfless love. Wow, I just, that just that's a great song. I, I just uh, thank you for singing that song. That, that is just a great song. Well, if you have your Bible, open the book of 1 Samuel 25. We're going to finish this up. We're going to finish up about how we can respond to things in life. But, uh, you know, again, in the midst of this, we're talking about Nabal, the fool, right? So I thought since we're into, you know, since we're talking about fools and all of that, I, I have a couple other little stories for you this morning. This is, for, this is for us as grandparents, okay? These are grandparent stories. One grandmother said, I didn't know that if my granddaughter had learned her colors yet, so I decided to test her. I would point out something and say, what color, it, what color is that? She would tell me and was always correct. It was fun for me, so I continued. At last, we headed to the door and she said, Grandma, I think you should try to figure out some of these colors yourself. <laughs> ah, that was pretty good. Smart kid. Um, so, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit that one. I... Uh, Ask me at the door. I, um, it's funny, but I don't want. I, I'm in trouble enough as it is. I don't need to. But that one's really funny. Anyway, I'll. Um, you can. You'll sit the whole time. Okay. So little grandson said to his grandpa, said, uh, "Grandpa, how old are you?" And he kind of hesitated. And the grandson said, "Well, Grandpa, if you don't know, you can just look in your underwear. Mine says I'm four to six. <laughs> Actually, I thought that was pretty good. We'd all be young. Can you imagine? Sorry, son, I'm 62. Wow. Anyway, um, so, okay, anyway. Back to 1 Samuel 25. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, that, that's the foolish stuff, okay? So we'll get down, we'll get real serious a little bit more now. But 1 Samuel 25, again, we, we are looking at this... Uh, Somewhat familiar story, I would think, for, for many of us about Nabal and Abigail and how they all responded. And what we're trying to d decide through this is what's the best way to respond when things don't quite go the way we expect or when life doesn't take the turn we wanted or when someone mistreats us or when someone uh, does what Nabal did to David. We're trying to figure out what our our responses. Well, we looked last time at Nabal's ignorant response. I mean, Nabal was just one ignorant guy. This, on Friday and Saturday, we had about 30, a little over 30 people here for our counseling um, seminar we had, and I, it, was, it was very good. I, I appreciated those that came, and one of the things that was said a couple of times, and I hadn't really ever followed this particular word through, but I'm going to this week, I'm going to try to spend a little more time looking at it, but they talked about uh, some verses in the Old Testament especially that just say that people are stupid. Now in our home, we don't, we're not allowed to say that. I can say it today because uh, Brooklyn and uh, Cooper aren't here. But in our home, if you say stupid in front of Cooper, he'll look up at you and go, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> okay. Like when I would say those stupid giants can't score, you know, <laughs> until yesterday. But anyway, um, Cooper will just go, Grandpa, you shouldn't say that. But I learned this week, man, stupid's a good word. You know, I, I mean, and I thought, I'm going to start using those verses um, because that was, if I could pick a word, that would be my word for Nabal. He was just stupid. He was just ignorant. He was just a fool. And he lived out those foolish decisions. And we don't have time this morning because I need to get to some other things. But, you know, Psalm 14, 1, do you know that verse? The fool has said in his heart, what? 
There is no God. Here, let me, let me put it in, I learned this week, I'll use this word. You're stupid if you say there's no God. You are. I mean, anybody that can look around to the, to the created world, anybody that can look at a tree, anybody that can look at this body and say it was all by accident is stupid. They're just a fool. Now I get it, spiritually they're blind and lost and all those things and so I understand why people say there is no God but if you analyze it, it's just foolish. It's foolish to think something as complex as this universe is could be all by accident. Well Nabal was that kind of a guy. Nabal was a man who was just a fool in his decisions. He just made ignorant responses and you saw that in the passage which we read last week so we won't reread it again this week but the only simple question was David in verse 5 sent some of his men and he wanted to see if Nabal would share some of the some of the food from the from the shearing of the sheep I mean David and his men had protected David and his 600 men had apparently sat guard around Nabal and his sheep and his herds and so David didn't think it was uh, it was out of the question to ask for some of the proceeds from that and so he sent his men and you know I kind of you know you, you need to make sure you're analyzing in a little bit I mean you know David is asking from Nabal provisions for 600 men have you ever fed 600 men have you ever fed six men you know what I'm saying I mean it may be that Nabal thought that's kind of a big request I mean get, get I mean he wasn't talking about a couple of loaves of bread and you know a couple of lamb chops here you know he was wanting an, and so in that request, I mean, David, it was very simple. He thought he deserved it, and he probably did, he and his men. But Nabal's answer was just, again, so uh, foolish. Look at it in verse 10. And Nabal said, who is David? I mean, you can kind of put it in your own, you know, you can kind of put the, the, the tone on it that you want, but I think he was like, who is David? Like, who is he to ask? Now, isn't the next question interesting? Apparently, Nabal knew who David was, because then he said, who is the son of Jesse? You get it, right? He knew who David was. David was the son of Jesse. I mean, he understood who this guy was. He understood. I don't, these were lying questions. He wasn't asking them on purpose. On a, to, to learn something. He knew who he was. Who's David? You know, the son of Jesse guy. I, somebody should have looked at him and say, Nabal, apparently you know who he is. Yeah. You know his family genealogy, going back to his dad. And of course then he said, are you kidding me? Maybe, maybe they're just rebels that have broken away. Nabal's ignorant response. Sometimes again, we are confronted with truth. Sometimes we are confronted with things that uh, are being asked of us and rather than respond like we should, we make the same kind of foolish comments and we'll do anything we can other than do what's right. Nabal's ignorant response. Well the second thing was David's impulsive response. I said last week that once again, what a contrast, what a contrast that's sandwiched in between chapters 24 and chapter 26. Chapter 24, David protects the life of King Saul. Chapter 26, David will protect the life of King Saul. In chapters 24 and 26, it would appear that David was, he understood how he should respond to the, to the man who was seeking his life, but you come to chapter 25, and David doesn't respond that way. He responds impulsively. He responds emotionally. David in this chapter allowed his hurt feelings, he allowed his anger to drive his decisions. You don't read in these verses that David prayed. You don't read in these verses that David tried to decide what was God's will. Rather, he just impulsively decided to do something. Be careful of what we impulsively say we will do. 
Be careful of saying things that you will later come to regret. David said, we're going to go get this guy and we're going to kill this guy and we're going to, we're going to, how dare him tell me I can't have what is rightfully mine. David's impulsive response was the kind of response that is just out of character with chapters 24 and chapter 26. Somebody cuts you off on the highway and your impulse is to cut them off. Road rage is built on that. Somebody, you come to church and somebody says something to you that you think is not right and so instead of responding biblically, you just respond back in kind. People get into an argument and one person says something unkindly and so the other one it's unkind and, and it just then it starts building and the, and the volume builds and the, and the angry words build until somebody has to finally say, I'm not going to throw any more logs on that fire. Impulse is rarely ever a good thing to respond on unless you are somehow impulsively ready to act on something from God's perspective, generally we don't think about what we're going to say. David certainly didn't think about what he was going to say. This was not God's will to go and try to kill Nabal and his men. It was David's will. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms if you would because again, uh, David says something in Psalm 19 that I found quite interesting. In Psalm 19... You know, that's the chapter, Psalm 19 is the chapter on God's Word. If you ever need a chapter in the Bible, I mean, I, we all understand Psalm 119, right? I mean, that whole long section, you know, 22 sections, 8 verses each. But I like Psalm 19 myself. Verses 1 to 6 is general revelation. Chapters 7 through basically 11 are special revelation. But it's what he says in 12 and 13. He says, who can discern his error? Acquit me from hidden faults. Also, now notice, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I will be acquitted of great transgression. As I thought about David's impulsive response, I thought about this. Oh, it's too bad David didn't practice his own message. James chapter 3 gets it right when it says not many of you want to be teachers because we teachers are held to a higher accountability before God. See, I mean, it's so easy for me to stand up here and I can give you all kinds of pious platitudes and I can tell you all about how to live and, you know, as a parent, it's kind of the same thing. We can tell our children how they should live and I grew up listening to this little phrase every now and again, don't do as I do, do as I say. That is terrible advice. Because I'm going to guarantee you I'm going to do what you do quicker than I'm going to do what you say. Because what you do, if it's good enough for you, if it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander. Man, do we have geese here or what, huh? You ought to come here someday. Oh my, they, you can't sleep, I'll tell you that right now. I mean, you know, it's terrible. You climb under your, you know, desk at two o'clock to take that little power nap, you know. It's just ridiculous. But anyway, um, that, that was a side note. Didn't mean to get onto the geese, but I'm a little bitter about them. So, um, <laughs> to talk about things. But, um, but my point is, is that you can't just tell your children this is what you need to do. So for me, you know, I have to always be careful. Because if I'm not prepared to at least attempt to live up to what I'm telling you, then I better not tell you. I don't want to live something opposite. And I thought about David. I thought, David, if you had just... I don't know that he had written Psalm 19 when he had the experience in 1 Samuel 25. But if he had just practiced that, he wouldn't have responded the way he did. He would never have thought about going out and killing a man just because of he was turned down for this request of food, whether he was, it was deserved or not. David's impulsive response, just be very careful when you respond to people. Be careful of how you speak and say. Well, the greatest portion of the chapter is given over to point three, Abigail's intelligent response. 
I mean, Abigail was a smart woman. She was a wise woman. Just the total opposite of Nabal, who was worthless and unscrupulous and uncouth and mean-spirited and selfish and arrogant. He, Abigail was just the opposite. I said last week, and I, and I, you know, how did they get together, you know? I do think the arranged marriage thing might be a, a really good idea. I mean, it could be that they were both like Nabal currently still is. They could have both been like that, and Abigail got her life right with God, or there's a number of different scenarios, but however we However it happened, Abigail was married to Nabal, and Abigail was absolutely the opposite of her husband. And isn't it interesting that in verse 18, then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and loaded them on the donkeys. I don't know whether that would represent approximately what David expected Nabal to give, whether it was more or less, I don't know. But it had to be somewhere in a vicinity, right? Because she was still figuring out she was going to feed six hundred men. So maybe you get a little bit of an idea as to why Nabal was so ticked off at David asking him for such a thing. But her intelligent response when she heard about what her foolish husband did, she took off to find David. You know, isn't it interesting at verse 21... They, well, verse 20, in the middle of it, said David and his men were coming down towards her, so she met them. And David said, had said, surely in vain I have guarded all this men's that he has in the wilderness, so nothing was missed and all that. And may God do the enemies. And verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried, dismounted from her donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at her feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you. And listen to the words of your maidservant. Let me tell you something. Abigail understood what to do when there was trouble. Ladies, a couple of little, a little kind of notes to you as it relates to how Abigail responded to this. Please take note that her response was not to run down to the wilderness and find her husband and tell him what an idiot he was, though he was. She didn't run down to him and say, you jerk, what are you thinking? Why did you turn down that to David? Now look what's going to happen. We're all going to die because of you. She didn't do that. She didn't run down and say to Nabal anything. She decided that in order to do her best to repair the situation, she would go right to the source, which was David. And she took Nabal's blame. She wasn't being disingenuous. She understood that she, as the wife of Nabal, she had, by sort of a tacit connection, she had some blame involved. I can't help but imagine she didn't think to herself, if somebody had just come and told me, <laughs> instead of going and telling my foolish husband. But notice, she, she took the blame. She said, she said David, look, it... it it was really my fault. Please don't let this, verse 25, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man. Now again, she, I don't think she was being unkind here. She was just being truthful. He was worthless. He was unscrupulous. He was foolish. I think she was just saying to David, look, this, this guy, he, 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 I get it. I, maybe, Maybe she had felt the same way at times. Like, you know, you're not going to live to the morning. <laughs> but she knew that she couldn't take that wrath in her own hands. And maybe that's partly what drove her to David. I don't know. But she said, look, he, he is a worthless guy. I get it. And his name is as he is. Nabal, he's a fool. He was folly all the time. Oh, and by the way, don't you find it intriguing that David stopped? You know, for David to stop and talk to this woman, that was pretty amazing. I mean, it also speaks to David. 
Now we're going to eventually get to David's godly response in a minute. But I need you to stop and think about it right now. Here's David listening to this woman talk about the situation and why he shouldn't go kill her husband. Speaks to David as well. But Nabal, excuse me, Abigail went and said, look, 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 l l let me try to, let me try to turn your attention because David, here's the thing. If you do evil against Nabal, you will live to regret it. Folks, again, I, I, you know, this weekend as we did our, our counseling seminar, a lot of what we talk about, a lot of what the Bible teaches as it relates to, to a, to a nuthetic approach to dealing with people is you need to take personal responsibility and you need to go to the person that you have the trouble with. There'd be a whole lot of less problems in our marriages, there'd be a whole lot less problems in our churches, in our families, in our jobs, if people would stop talking to somebody else about the problem. In the old days, we could say it'd be great if we just cut our telephone cords. Can't say that anymore. It'd be great if all the cell towers went down. Or the internet. Oof. So much easier now to just spill your, your vial. Abigail went to David. She went right to where the needed source was. And she told David what he needed to hear. David, look, don't go through with this. You'll live to regret it. If we really wanted, we could parade a non-stop for, I don't know, days, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years of people who, would, if they were going to be dead honest, would walk across this platform, stop at that microphone and tell you, I wish I'd listened to godly counsel. Yeah, if I had just listened and done what was right, but I didn't. I rejected God's word, I rejected godly counsel, and I went my own way, and I have lived to regret it. That vengeance that I enacted on that person who hurt me, that didn't bring me any joy. Not listening to people when they said you can't go down that path. Oh, we could have a whole stream of people. Abigail said, David, you don't want to do that. Are any of you in that place? Are, are, are any of you right now, if you would be honest with yourself before the Lord, are you thinking of doing, some, doing things or saying things? Or are you, in fact, in the midst of something that you know is absolutely unbiblical, ungodly? You know that you're holding a grudge or you're holding a, some kind of hatred. You, are, you, have, you have cut yourself off from people. Or maybe it's the kind of thing that you're involved in situations or relationships or you're doing something that is absolutely not godly and you are unwilling to repent and go the other way. You just want to go your own way, listen to me, there will come a day when you'll regret it. You just will. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week, next year. But I can just about guarantee you will wake up someday and regret it. Often be when it's too late. Abigail's intelligent response I mean, again, she was the noble one. There was Nabal, and then there was the one who was noble. <laughs> Just the opposite. I want you to see David's insightful response. Look at it in verse 35, well, 32. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to, the, to me this day. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself on my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, notice, harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would have been no one left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. 
So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. So I've listened to you and granted your request. David listened to godly counsel. David listened to intelligent counsel. And he changed his way. I've sat with people over the years, whether it's been in a kind of a formal way or an informal way, but I've sat with people and I've said to them, this is what God's word says. And so it is your choice. I like to tell people, the book of Proverbs says, the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. That means if you choose to go down a transgressing way, a sinful way, expect life to get hard. Because so often people will say, and I've heard them say this to me, they'll say, but pastor, if I do what you want, that will be hard. I never discount that. I tell them, you're right, it will be hard. Listen, when you have a life habitual sin and there's something that has gripped you for 40 years, I'm not gonna, I don't have a panacea. I don't have wiffle dust to sprinkle over you. I'm not some fairy godfather who can just say, poof, and it's gone. You're right. It'll take hard work. You're going to have to, you're going you're gonna to win some days and you're going to lose some days. But we want to get more wins than losses. Because I'm a sports guy, I like to tell people, I like to use a, I like to, and since, since the Giants won yesterday, I'll use baseball as my example, okay? But I like to tell people, you know what, let's just say someone says, you know, but pastor, I, I, I haven't been reading my Bible at all. I just quit reading it. You know what I do not say to them? You go out of my office and this week you read it seven days this week. I don't tell them that. You know why? They're not going to do that. What am I, stupid? Oh, yeah, that's that Bible word again, you know. Uh, they're not going to do that. Here's what I say to them. I want you to read your Bible on Monday and on Thursday. Let's get back together next week and see how it's going. They come back in. Did you read your Bible? <sighs> read it on Monday. You know what I say? Woohoo! That's great! You know why? That's one more time than you had done the week before. See, think about baseball. If you can bat 350 in the MLB, you can make millions of dollars, right? Millions of dollars hitting, batting 350. What that means for you non-baseball advocates, I cannot believe it, but for you who don't follow such things, this is what it means. Guy comes to bat 10 times and he gets a bat, he gets a hit every three and a half times. I never have figured out how that halftime is, but anyway, maybe that's between the dugout and the base. But anyway, home plate. Anyway, he only gets a hit three out of ten times, basically. Seven times. Twice as many times as he gets a hit, he gets an out, and he gets paid millions of dollars for it. That's kind of crazy. There is not one person in baseball who bats a thousand. Not one. Ted Williams was the greatest hitter in baseball, and I think his greatest year was a 420 or something like that. I mean, it was a little over 400. Why am I saying all that? I'm saying it because, oh, listen, in our spiritual lives, yes, we should read the Bible seven days a week. Yes, we should pray seven days a week. But if you're trying to rebuild your spiritual life, don't set yourself up for failure. David listened to godly counsel and he changed his direction. It takes humility. I mean, David had to be humble, humble enough to listen to this woman, first of all. He had to be humble enough to say, you know what, you're right, I was wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was acting on impulse. This wasn't, now that you say all this to me, this wasn't what God wanted me to do. This is what I wanted to do. And I kind of think in verse 34, he's reflecting on that. And he's like, oh man, think of what I could have, just think of what I would have done in the next 12 hours, Abigail, if you hadn't come. David's insightful response. Uh, I could only wish that the chapter had stopped there. I, I would have loved to the, for the story to have ended there, but it didn't. In verse 36, I put there God's immediate response and how interesting what will take place in the next 10 days. 
Abigail came to Nabal, that is, she came home. Behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry with his men, for he was very drunk. So she didn't tell him anything at all until the morning light. <laughs> I mean, here's Abigail talking to this future king about how foolish her husband had been, and please don't go through with it, and here, receive my gift, and David, listen, if you go that path, you're, you're, you're going to live to regret it. Here was Abigail standing in the place of God as a spokesman to talk to David, and in the meantime, kind of like a story, you know, if, if this was a movie or a TV show, they would, there would be Abigail, and all of a sudden they'd cut back to the home front, and there's Nabal with all of his buddies throwing down his Budweiser's, getting drunk to a, 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 as much as he can, and just having a grand old time. Probably because I can just imagine they're clinking their glasses. Ha! We told that David off, didn't we? Ha! Stupid guy. He's not getting any of my food. I don't know what they were talking about. It's not there, but I just kind of, in my mind, they, I mean, they're rejoicing. They're having this big feast. I mean, they're just, they're just partying down. Totally oblivious to truth. Man. By the way, I, I see that if I can say with my baseball theme, I see that often at the games. I don't know why some people come to the games because by the time about the fifth inning rolls around, I don't even think they can see the field. I mean, I'll guarantee, I mean, I sit there <laughs> $10.50 for a beer and I go, you just like, that's your 10th one. I mean, without exaggeration. You know, I mean, I'm just like, what? anyway, just totally out of control. That was Nabal. I mean, so, so look at verse 37. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things. Now note it. Stop right there. You're already read ahead, read ahead. But she went and told him these things. I, I, ladies, again, she didn't go to Nabal, first of all, and again say, Nabal, you're an idiot. She wanted to tell him what she had done. And by the way, she was smart as to timing because she knew when she came home, it's, there's no business talking to him now. He's in, no, he's in no shape to talk to him now, so I'll wait till the morning. And when she told him what she had done, that she had gone and talked to David and, and stood in the gap, and, and David had fortunately changed his mind, Nabal's heart died within him, and he became as a stone. Did he have a stroke? Did he have a heart attack? I mean, you know, we don't know, but what we do know is, is his heart became like a stone, and he was incapacitated. I mean, did it all of a sudden overcome Nabal? Like, what was I thinking? I don't know. What I do know is, is that just like that, he was on a bed with his heart as dead as a stone. It's the next verse, verse that you got to notice. Did you see it? The next verse says, and about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Why 10 days? Why not boom right now? Because God is so merciful. I think he gave Nabal 10 days to get things right. Listen, you don't always have 10 days. There are more than one person. I could, I could open an obituary page from any paper across the United States. I could go on to any obituary page on the internet I could find. And there are people who had all kind of plans for this day. And by the end of the day, they were gone. They don't get 10 days. God gave Nabal 10 days. I think to think about his life and to make a change. We don't read anywhere that he made the change, but God gave him that change. Verse 39, David heard that Nabal was dead, and he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned evil doing on Nabal for his own head. Let me tell you something. When we were in chapter 24, I said, part of the reason we don't want to hold a grudge is we need, we need to give place to God's wrath. Don't take it into your own hands. Listen, God is fully capable of punishing the evildoer, whether it is in this life or certainly in eternity. God is fully functional to able to 
punish the evildoer. You don't have to do it. God struck Nabal. God made Nabal exactly how David wanted Nabal to be, which was dead. But David didn't have to do it. God didn't tell David to go do it. But God said, yeah, I want people to understand that's what can happen to the fool. Nabal's dead. Again, I wish the story ended there. Because the rest of the chapter, frankly, is a great disappointment. Because the end of that, the end of that verse says, at the end of verse 39, then David sent a proposal to Abigail, Abigail to take her as his wife. And David sent and all of that, and I, I don't have time, so just jump over to verse 43. And David had also taken Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they had both been his wives. And, but David was also married to Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of... I mean, uh, come with me quickly to 2 Samuel 3. We're going to stop by these verses many months in ahead when we get to these places. But go to 2 Samuel chapter 3 for just a quick minute. Verse 2, sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Ammon of, of Ahinoam, the Jezreelites. And the second was Caleb by Abigail. And then a son of Maka. And then a Haggith and an Abital and Eglah. There are six wives listed there. Six wives that are listed there. Come over to chapter 5 if you would. Chapter 5 and verse 13. Meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron, and many sons and daughters were born to David, and these are the names of those who were born to him, blah, blah, blah. I, li I listed there at the end of the, my outline, I put David's illicit response. It's unbelievable to me how many commentators want to try to okay David's decision to marry. All these commentators who say, well, you know, polygamy was... Okay in those days. There was lots of polygamists. There were. Abraham was a polygamist. Jacob was a polygamist. I mean, I could go down through the Old Testament, right? I mean, one guy who had multiple wives. Listen to me. It was always sin. God's plan has always been, since Adam and Eve, one wife one woman, one life. He never approved of polygamy. Let me read you a couple of things that were written, which I thought were very, very well done. A guy named Steve Farrar, a book called Finishing Strong. We've talked about it before. In fact, I think we gave some away. I loved what he said. Listen, he says, somewhere around the age of 18, give or take a year or two, David was anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel. And David did not actually become king until he was 30. When David was anointed to become king at 18, he had no wife. When he assumed the throne at 30, he had six wives. F.B. Meyer sums up what happened to David before he ever shipwrecked with Bathsheba. Listen, because the account that we will get to in 2 Samuel 11 is about when kings went off to war, David stayed back and had whole thing with Bathsheba. And some people seem to think that the whole thing with Bathsheba happened overnight. It didn't. F.B. Meyer went on to say, in direct violation of the law of Moses, he took more concubines and wives, fostering in him a habit of sensual indulgence which predisposed him to the evil invitation of that evening hour. David eventually had eight wives. Some scholars think he had as many as twelve. Now listen to what he says. He said there are no Susan, Linda, Donna, or Kathy in this group of wives. Try these names on for size. Michael, Ahinoam, Abigail, Maka, Haggith, Abital, Eglah, and Bathsheba. In addition to these eight wives who are named, he had at least ten concubines. By these eight wives, David had 21 sons and one daughter. And he had even more children by his concubines. To put it plainly, by ignoring God's command to be a one-woman man, David had one very large, messed-up family, and he would live to regret it. Polygamy was the continual crack in David's armor and he passed it on to his son Solomon. <laughs> yeah. Another author said it like this, David set the course 
of his own shipwreck the moment he married a second wife. Then he married a third, and by the time he was on a roll, and he married a fourth, followed by a fifth, and by the time he was third, he had six wives. David was a polygamist. That word means many marriages or many wived. God's plan for David was that he would be a one-woman kind of man, but David wanted to be a many-wived kind of man. One other quick comment. Kent Hughes, who I like a lot of the stuff Kent Hughes has written, Pastor John showed me this in a book called Disciplines of a Godly Man. And he talks about, he's talking about 2 Samuel 5 and 7. But relating to our passage, it goes on to say David's taking additional wives was sin. Now listen to this paragraph. We must understand that a progressive desensitization to sin and a consequent inner descent from holiness had taken root in David's life. David's collection of wives, though it was legal and not considered adultery in the culture of the day, was nevertheless sin. King David's sensual indulgence desensitized him to God's holy call in his life as well as to the danger and the consequences of falling. In short, listen, in short, David's embrace of a socially permitted sensuality desensitized him to God's call and made him easy prey for the fatal sin of his life. It is the legal sensualities, the culturally acceptable indulgences, which take us down. When you come to the end of this chapter, oh, it would have been so nice if it had just ended with David listening to Abigail. It would have been so nice if it had just ended with God punishing Nabal. But no, it ends with David's illicit response by saying, you know what? Abigail's a beautiful woman. I'm going to add her to my collection of wives. I think I, not I think, I said it when we began this study that David's Biggest chink in his armor, though he was a man after God's own heart, his biggest chink in his armor was women. And folks, if he had 8 to 12 wives and 10 to 20 or a few more concubines, his son outdid his dad like 70-fold. 700 wives and 300 concubines. Folks, I would imagine in this room this morning, in our auditorium, this morning in this church service, there are some of you who are playing with fire and you think you won't get burned. You're playing on the, with maybe even culturally acceptable things. You are messing around with stuff that you're not going to get arrested for. No one's going to put you in jail for it. Because people think it's okay. Culture says, oh, that's all right. Go for it. But it's desensitizing you to spiritual things and holiness in your life. And maybe rather than look at King David from the vantage point that we're trying to look at him as a man after God's own heart, you'd rather look at a passage like that and say, well, if it was good enough for David, it's good enough for me. Apparently that's what Solomon thought. How'd that work out for him? Not so good. You can't play with sin and not get burned. And it's so sad to me to read that. And I'm going to tell you right now, I, I mean, it is a conundrum. I like that word. It is a question I have. How was David a man after God's own heart and yet collect all these women? I, I don't have an answer to that, so don't ask me at the door. But it really makes me stop and say, God, what is it in my life that I'm willing to just overlook my holiness and get it and yet still want to be a man after your heart? Oh, there are, guaranteed. I mean, I'm not perfect. I don't stand here before you as some perfect example, but I can tell you this. When I look at King David, I go, yeah, but David, look at the consequences. When we eventually get to Bathsheba, 
I mean, that story is so well known, and we know what happened after all that, right? But when we finally get to 2 Samuel 11, sometime in the future, we will reflect back to this day. Because Bathsheba didn't happen overnight. Bathsheba was just one more in the line of David's unwillingness to have a proper line morally. If you're here this morning and you're messing around with sin and you think it's hidden, oh, it's probably hidden from me, maybe hidden from all the people around here, but I'll tell you, I guarantee it's not hidden between you and it's not hidden from God. Why don't you get right? Why, why don't you confess that thing and forsake it? Why don't, why don't you say, God, then with you there will be victory? I mean, why, why don't you just say, I'm done running? Let's pray. Father, I thank you.